Hawkbrook doesn't take the summer off. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. People are getting discipled. We're serving strong, and we're moving forward. We're in a, this wonderful series we call the Book of James uh, for these summer months. And this week, we turn to James chapter 2. And in your Bible, this little section of Scripture is either titled, probably most Bibles are either going to have it titled, Beware of Favoritism or A Warning Against Prejudice. And I need to tell you that we planned this series months ago, and so we have been planning for weeks with the title for this weekend to be Eliminating Prejudice. Obviously not knowing that going into this weekend, the topic that would be on everyone's minds and the topic that would be dominating our lives, our conversations, dominating the news, dominating the radio, social media, dominating politics would be the topic of prejudice and discrimination. So as we study this passage of scripture, and as I preach through this outline today, I need you to know that nothing in this message is a direct response to anything in the news today. And I tell you that because as I'm preaching, I don't want you thinking that I'm talking in code I don't want you thinking that, oh, well, Ryland, he, he's really talking about the shootings that have happened this past week or throughout our nation over the last couple months, or he's really talking about refugees there, or he's really talking about immigration or homosexuality, oh, he's really talking about women's rights or talking about abortion, or, oh, man, I'm so glad Ryland said that because that, that was a good response to what that politician said. That's, that's not what's going on. Today And in fact, this message isn't a response to any of that, and this message isn't about any of that. While at the same time, it's about all of it. Does that make sense? It's not, it's not directly related to any one of those things, but it's about all of them. And my goal is that this sermon today would be as timeless and as transferable as the scripture it comes from, because the words we're going to look at today are 2,000 years old, and they're exactly what James' audience needed to hear then, and they're exactly what we need to hear today, because, hello, we don't need another conversation, we don't need another speech, we don't need another talking head, we don't need another knee-jerk reaction, we don't need another social media rant, we need the Word of God and us proclaiming the Word of God, amen? Amen. So James 2, verse 1 says, my brothers... And sisters, and if I've learned anything studying James, it's that whenever he says, my brothers and sisters, we're about to get nailed. It's about to get serious. He says, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. He's talking about partiality, prejudice, uh, discrimination, favoritism. The Greek word that James would have literally penned down as he's writing this letter would have been a compound word. It means to receive and to face. It means to receive someone at face value. That's what favoritism means. A, a simpler way to put it would be a superficial judgment. And James says, don't do that. Don't accept people just on superficial judgments. A superficial judgment is when I take the facts of the matter and I assume to know why they are that way. So I take the facts about someone or I take the facts about a decision they have made and I assume to know why they have made that decision. And I assume to know why they do the things they do and I assume to know why they look the way they look. And the good news translation of the Bible is going to say this verse this way. It says, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. And today, that's called discrimination. So let's start, let's look at some common areas of discrimination. Because I think this topic of discrimination is a lot broader than people naturally think. The, the first one is appearance. We discriminate often because of appearance. Beauty is everything in this world. We judge people by their appearance, how they look, how they dress. I ask you to ask yourself today, I'm asking myself today, how do I judge people? Do I judge people by, I mean, how do I size them up? I mean, do I make a superficial judgment immediately by how they look, what they wear, how they style their hair? Another common point of discrimination is age. You're too young. You're too old. 
we'll sometimes think, man, that person is way too old for me to learn from. They couldn't have anything relevant to say in my life. There's no way an old person like that's going to have any new ideas in this workplace or in this environment. Or we'll say, they're too young. There's no way I could learn from that person. They don't know anything about anything. They don't know what I'm going through. They haven't experienced anything. I can learn from people that are younger than me, and you can learn from people that are younger than you, because they've had experiences you haven't had, and they've learned things that that we haven't learned. We hear all the time, all young people are entitled. They just feel entitled. They're young. They're lazy. Well, that's not true. And so we don't make generalizations or superficial judgments about someone because of their age or because of their achievement. Our society loves winners, and we love to forget losers. We just love the superstar, and we love to give them special treatment, and we love to look up to them, and we like to make, make them role models, whether or not they really deserve to be role models, and we like to model our lives after them, whether or not they deserve it or whether or not they even asked for that. Another common discrimination is ancestry. We judge people according to their race, their nationality, their ethnic background, what language they speak. And God is really disappointed when we make superficial judgments based on diversity because God loves diversity and he loves variety and he celebrates it. Because when Jesus created the world, when he created the heavens and the earth, he created all of creation with diversity. There's diversity and variety between galaxies. There's diversity between animals. I heard last week there's like 6,000 types of beetles. We don't need that many beetles. Come on, why is there so many beetles? Because God loves variety. He loves diversity. And there's diversity between humans. He uniquely chose who your parents would be. He chose when you would be born, where you would be born. He chose your race. He chose your nationality. And he doesn't want you trying to be anyone else. And he definitely doesn't want you thinking less of someone. Because he made them with those unique attributes. And the Bible commands us to respect every person because every person is made in the image of God. So he says, when you disrespect someone else, you disrespect me. We got to remember, heaven is not going to look like you. I don't care what you look like. There's just going to be so much diversity. It's pretty much guaranteed you're not going to be in the majority. There's going to be so much diversity in heaven. In heaven, there will be people from all times of history, from every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. It means every language. So the English-speaking section of heaven is going to be like this little corner over there, and everyone's going to go, oh, there's the English-speaking section. Yeah, glad we found you. And when it comes to the Western English-speaking section, I mean, it's going to be like two pews, everybody. I mean, it's, we're not going to be in the majority. So if you don't like people that don't speak your language, and if you don't like people that have different values, different customs, different cultures than you, you're robbing yourself of the hope of heaven. And you're missing the point of what God is trying to do here because he reached out and God saved the outsiders. And then he said to the outsiders, go find more outsiders and tell them about me so they can be saved too. And he's given us a mission to reach outsiders. This this verse isn't in your notes. It's not on the screen. But this is a quote from Jesus in Mark eleven seventeen. 17. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Another common discrimination is affluence. And this is the example James uses in chapter 2. We judge people by their wealth, whether or not they're rich or poor, their economic status. And so I ask myself today, ask you to ask yourself, how do you think or what do you think about people who have more money than you do? What do you think about people who make a lot more money than you do? What do you think about people who make less and have far less than you do? Out of all the areas in which we can discriminate, this is the area that James chooses to use as an example. 
It's an example. We see it in verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So these two guys are strangers. They come into a church service at the same time. We know they're strangers because they don't know where to sit. And the first guy walks in and he's dripping with wealth. Everybody recognizes it. Everybody sees it. Because in New Testament times, all the Christians were poor. Most of them were slaves. And it says this guy's got gold rings. In New Testament times, you could rent rings to prove how wealthy, wealthy you were. And they would also cut jewels, sew them onto their clothes. And we need to notice that James does not criticize this man for being wealthy. He criticizes the members for being partial to him. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with having the wealth. It just says fine clothes. And it would have been been the Roman toga that the politicians would wear when they're running for re-election. And then comes in the guy who's poverty stricken and he's destitute and the usher has to make a decision. So the usher takes the wealthy guy, the guy with affluence, and takes him in and he sits him in in the front seat and he says, we want everyone to see that you're here. And we want every one of your needs taken care of. And then he says to the poverty stricken man, you can go stand in that corner or you can sit on the floor by my feet. And in the Greek, that would have been under my footstool and it's the ultimate put down. So he treats one man with care. He treats the other man carelessly. And that's showing favoritism. You're showing favoritism to one. You're discriminating the other. And James says there's, there's three problems with this. And the first one is that favoritism is unchristian. Faith and favoritism are incompatible. Why? Because we're a family. Let's look at verse 1 again. Let's read this out loud together. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. The other places in Scripture, the other places in the Bible where you're going to see the word favoritism, is this related to God saying God does not does not do it. He does not show favoritism. Romans 2.11 simply says, God does not show favoritism. Acts 10.34, Peter, he's at Cornelius' house. He, he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So you and I have the hope of heaven today and a relationship with Jesus Christ because God does not discriminate. He came and he lived the perfect life none of us could live. He died in everyone's place, not just for a specific group of people. And he rose again, and now his people, his body, the church. He's building his church. And he's saying, I'm going to create the one place on earth that no matter who you are, what your background is, what you look like, what you've done, you're welcome. And you're not only welcome, you're wanted, and we were waiting for you. And everyone can find salvation. He says, you can find hope. You can find a family. Because the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So favoritism is unchristian. Number two, favoritism is unreasonable. James just says, okay, this is actually illogical. Doesn't make sense. Verse five, listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Here he goes again. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? So he's not saying it's good to be poor and bad to be rich. He's, and he's not saying that only the poor will be saved. That's good news because every single person in this room is wealthy compared to the rest of the world. It doesn't make any difference to God. I'm so glad he doesn't look at a savings account or look at a wallet before he saves someone. Because our value is not based on our valuables. It doesn't matter where you buy your clothes or what car you drove into the parking lot today. God says it makes no difference to me. I don't confuse your self-worth with, with how much I value you. But James is writing to poor people. And James is saying, yeah, God chooses, chooses the poor. He does. I mean, Jesus wasn't rich. 
Jesus was born into poverty. He was born in a borrowed stable. He had to borrow a lunch to feed the 5,000. He spoke from a borrowed boat. He had to borrow a coin to make a point about money. He borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. He borrowed a room to celebrate Passover. He had to borrow the cross to be crucified. It didn't belong to him. It belonged to Barabbas. And he had to borrow a grave to be buried. It really belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And James says, God does not expect people to be wealthy to be saved. On top of this, he says, look, the rich couldn't care less about you. Why are you worrying about catering to this man? In verse 6, it says, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Now, let me explain this, because God isn't knocking rich people here. In New Testament times, it was the Roman nobility who were feeding the Christians to lions. They were persecuting them, they were insulting them, and they were feeding, like literally feeding them to lions. And James says, this doesn't even make sense, because they, I mean, you're all worried about impressing them, and they couldn't care less about impressing you. They're doing the opposite. But it's human nature, we generally like to get close to and to cater to and to kiss up to people who are affluent and to people who are wealthy and to people who are celebrities because we hope that they will do something for us. And James says, don't, do, don't, don't show favoritism. It's unchristian, it's unreasonable, it's, it doesn't make sense. And then in verse 8, he gives his primary reason and that is favoritism is unloving. That's why you shouldn't do it. I'm jumping to verse 8 here. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing it right. Why is it called the royal law? Because if we obeyed that one, we wouldn't need any other. We wouldn't need all the others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now love, love is wanting and doing what is best for someone. And we do that for ourselves. I want, I want what's best for me. And when I do what's best for me, I love myself. And God says, yeah, I want you to do that for other people too. I want you to want what's best for them, and I want you to do what's best for them. And the royal law, or the golden rule, is to do that for others as well. Want what is best for them, do what is best for them. Paul's going to say to the Galatians, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now think about all our nation's laws. Some of them are absolutely ridiculous that someone had to write that down and pass that through a capital. Because if we would just love, if we would just want and do what is best for people, we wouldn't have to have that as a law. The Bible says how I relate to other people shows me how much we really love God. 1 John 4.20, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So I can know today how much I love God. Like there's a metric, there's a scale. There's a way I can figure out how much I love God, and it's by how much I love you. James 2, 9 through 10, moving to verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Here's what James is saying. How many links in a chain do you have to break before you've broken the chain? Just one. I remember uh, going to a china shop as a, a little, little kid. Uh, it was at an antique store, actually, with my mom. And she physically put my hands in my pockets. <laughs> and she said, don't take your hands out of, these, out of your pockets because there's a sign on the door that says, you break it, you bought it. And how many cracks do you have to put in china plate before it's broken just one so how many laws do you have to break to be a lawbreaker just one how many crimes do you have to commit before you're a criminal just one and james is saying people think that favoritism is such a small sin but keep your hands in your pockets because it's serious business it's real because if you break god's rule you've broken god's rule 
James 2.11, for he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So you might say, well, what does God care if I'm partial to some people and discriminate against others? What does God care if I love this person and hate this person? I'm not a murderer. And God says, keep your hands in your pockets and and be careful there. Because if you break one link, you've broken the chain. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Love treats people with mercy. Love gives people what they need, not what they deserve. And James I imagine is thinking about his brother Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So that's, that's the problem. That's the problem with favoritism. It's unchristian. It's unreasonable. It's unloving. It's unloving to discriminate, to have prejudice. So how do you treat people? How do we do this right? How do you treat people right? I've got three things for us today. I actually had I don't know, I had this huge list of things of how to treat people right. I went down, I found the three that I think are, are kind of cornerstones. That if They're action steps that if we would do these, we would get so much right in how to treat people. And the first one is to encourage people. And I know I'm the one who put people there, but you might cross that out and put everyone. Because by people, I mean everyone. Yes, even the most popular kid at school is dying for encouragement. Everyone is dying for encouragement and dying for hope. Even the person at work who's always always succeeding, even the person who looks like their whole life is, is just put together and wonderful, everybody is dying for encouragement and dying to be lifted up because the world is dragging us down. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, read this out loud with me. Encourage one another and build each other up. Circle the word up. The world's dragging people down. It's our job to give people a lift when we can. It's actually, it's pretty humbling to encourage other people. And it's pretty humbling to just receive encouragement well, to to be encouraged by it, to say thank you, to say I appreciate it, to take it well. And sometimes, I don't know, we just get so caught up on encouragement, we think, well, and I don't, I'm not going to encourage that person because I don't want them to get a big head. You ever heard that? I've heard that. I think, oh, so you were going to encourage me, but instead you called me big-headed. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. But God never asked us to monitor other people's egos. God will take care of that. God never asked us to monitor how inflated someone's head is. He can do that just fine. He did ask you and me to encourage and to appreciate and to accept everyone. So I ask myself, and I ask you to ask yourself, is anyone going to be lifted up a little bit more because of you this week? Is anyone going to be, going to have a little bit more hope because you're their friend, or you work with them, or you're in their life? Is anyone going to benefit from your words and your life this week? Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And the church that accepts, the church that appreciates, and the church that affirms people is the church God blesses, and absolutely nothing can stop the church that is filled with encouragement and love. Nothing. But it doesn't happen accidentally. It requires an all-out effort by each of us. And every single person here today contributes to the atmosphere of this church. Every single person contributes to the nature and the atmosphere, either positively or negatively, to this church. Number two, forgive people. Many people are reluctant to show forgiveness because... They don't understand uh, the difference between forgiveness and trust. And pastor preaches on this often. He has so many incredible messages on forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting go of the past. 
Trust has to do with future behavior. So forgiveness doesn't mean that you allow someone to keep hurting you if they are hurting you. But forgiveness is, it's not forgetting what happened. It's about finding what good can come out of it now. It's about finding out how to respond to evil with good. And once I forgive someone, I can actually start being sympathetic and to begin to pray for them because the hurt that they carry is what caused them to hurt someone else. And the hurt that they have did not get healed, so it got handed down. Are you going to hand it down again? Are you going to get it healed now? So in forgiveness, I relinquish my right to get even, and I respond to evil with good. I love how the Apostle Paul puts this in Colossians 3.13. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And the love of Jesus covers your sin, and it also empowers you to let pe- other people off the hook. You've been forgiven. You can forgive others. And to begin loving people today, we must close the door on the past, and that can't happen without forgiveness. So forgive those who have hurt you. I don't care if it was I mean, horribly, horribly damaging, or if it was just one word of criticism that you've been holding on to, and you've been holding bitterness and resentment against that person because of that word. If you want to move forward, you've got to let go of the past. For your sake, for your sake, forgive that person. Jesus is going to say this. We find it in Matthew 6. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So I I forgive first because I've been forgiven by God. And I forgive second because when I have unforgiveness in my life, it makes my life absolutely miserable. And third, I'm going to forgive because I'm going to need some forgiveness in the future. And so we don't forgive for their benefit. We actually forgive for ours. And forgiveness is the gift that we give ourselves that allows us to move on with our lives and to break free from being trapped by past resentment. And I'm pleading with you today, no matter how big, how small, to forgive that person and move on with your life. And close the door on your past. Break free from the chains of resentment that are holding you down. And move forward with your life. So we're going to encourage people. We're going to forgive people. And number three, we're going to value people. That's how you treat people, right? Value begins with acceptance. That's the start, acceptance. I love our pastor because he cultivates an attitude of acceptance. From day one, he wanted this church to be a place where you go, that you think about. That's the place you go when you need another second chance. That's the place you go where when every other place has disqualified you, you can go to Rockbrook. And you can find a family, and you can find a home, and you can serve, and, and you can be built up. If you're perfect, you don't belong here. Because we're a church where people are growing. And this is a church for people who don't have it all together. Did you know that we have almost every spiritual background you could think of in this church? I mean, we've got people with backgrounds in every, every major religion. We've got people with backgrounds in every denomination. We've got Catholics. We've got Baptists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians. Lutherans, Assembly of God, Methodists, Pentecostals, Evangelical Free, Atheists, and nothing. People didn't know a thing about a thing about Jesus came in our doors, learned about Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter where you've been, it matters where you are now and if you want to know Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 7, accept one another, then for the glory of God as Christ has accepted you. I think why so many people have a hard time accepting others and so many churches have a hard time accepting others is because they confuse acceptance with approval. And there's a big difference there. You can accept someone without approving of their lifestyle. They may be doing something totally contrary to the word of God. 
You can accept them as a person, accept them as a friend, without approving of their sin. Jesus did this. Uh, He's the model for it. Because people who were absolutely nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And people, their lives didn't look anything like Jesus' life. They loved him, they liked him, they died for him. And together we make a commitment that this church will receive people unconditionally. And we don't expect people to act like believers until they are believers. And love draws outside people in. And God will use the church that will love people unconditionally. And he can use that kind of church to spark a spiritual awakening in their community. And everything hell could throw at it won't stop it. Nothing can stop a loving church. But none of that comes if we don't personally and individually get our hearts right. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. That you love each other. That you encourage one another. You forgive one another. You value. You value one another. I brought with me a $100 bill to illustrate value. I don't know where uh, exactly where this bill came from. And I don't know exactly when it was printed. And I don't know who's touched this, whose clean hands or filthy hands this bill has been in. I don't know where it's been. Could have been in California, could have been in New York. And I don't know what it's been used for could have been used to buy a family groceries for a week. Could have been used to buy drugs in a drug deal. This $100 bill could have gone through a strip club. It could have been used for sex trafficking. And I could mess with its condition, and it's starting to look pretty pitiful after four services, but I could tear into it, and I could crumple it up. And you and I could go outside and find some mud and stomp on it in the mud. But after all that, how much is this $100 bill worth? Not a trick question. (laughs) It's $100. And God has placed a value on your life and a worth on your life. And it doesn't matter when you were born, where you were born, what you've done in your life, the places you've been, It doesn't matter your condition. You could be depressed today. You could be full of hope. God says, I knew every wrong thing that you were going to do. And I created you anyway. And I sustained you. And you were worth dying for. And that's your value. And so the people that I choose not to love... God says, I, I value them. Listen, your location has no determination on your value. You're not more valuable today because you're sitting in church. You're not more valuable than the people who aren't sitting in church. You're not more valuable because you're alive in 2016 in the Midwest of the United States of America than all the people who aren't. Your location, your condition, what you've done does not determine your value. History has no impact on it. There's nothing you can do to change it. And the people that we hesitate to love, God values them just as much as he values you. So let's be known for our love. Let's be known for our encouragement. Let's be known for forgiving people. Let's be known for valuing people. Let's be known for loving God and loving others. I need to close in prayer. We close every message in prayer. But as we go into this time of prayer, I do want to turn the page and turn our attention to what's happened uh, in our nation and around the world in the last week, over the last couple months. I'm going to pray through a prayer. We're seeing this, this verse a lot right now. It's Second Chronicles 7.14. It said, if my people, it's God's, God talking, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land. And in that verse, God lays out the four things that his people should do to respond to crisis, to respond to tragedy, 
the four things we should do if we want our, our land healed. So I'm going to pray through those four things. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray together. God, we humble ourselves. Some are saying that this is your wrath that we're seeing, that this is God's wrath. But we know all of your wrath was laid on Jesus at the cross. It's been paid for. God, this isn't you judging us. This is us judging ourselves. It's us who have said that we have a better way. And just like the prodigal son, we turned away from the safety of your house and and your will. And you warned us against this, and we still turned away. And the root cause of all our problems and all the problems we see in the world is that we have left the safety of your will. So we humble ourselves before you. We don't, we don't point the finger at everyone else. We can look at our lives, our relationships with others, and our relationship with you. You said we should humble ourselves and then we should pray. So we respond by calling out to you, God. You're our only hope. And we thank you that you're always only one prayer away. We could run our whole lives, but you're still only one prayer away. God, we humble ourselves, we pray, and we seek your face. We seek your character. We say, God, you know best. We do not know best. You know best. We ask you to show us where we have strayed away from your character. And may it be true now more than ever that no unwholesome talk comes out of our mouths, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And fourth, we turn from our wicked ways. We repent, we turn to you. May we each be like the prodigal son and that we run back home. And I pray that an outstretched hand, a loving smile, a warm hug, for every person who worships here at Rockbrook. Help us to be a church known for love. Help us to have a reputation that we love you and that we love other people. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.